Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to have a discussion about the U.S. military adopting the 6.8 by 51. They actually went forward with this and did it. And it's rather surprising to us, and we want to discuss that. Not only do we want to discuss the armies and the Marines are going to buy these as well, we want to discuss their decision to do this and adopt the M5 rifle system and the M250 belt-fed uh, lightweight machine gun. It's a light machine gun, not a general purpose machine gun. And also kind of touch on whether or not it makes sense for civilians to update their self-defense rifles from, say, 5.56 to the new 6.8x51. With all that being said, uh, we have Jason here with us today, and we have Pad here with us today, and we're going to discuss this. So, guys, this really took me by surprise, right? So I've lived through the XM8. I've lived through, you know, the, the OC... WIS, whatever it was, crazy thing that produced the XM8 and the 25 millimeter smart munitions gun. I've seen the military try to replace the M4, I don't know how many times in my lifetime. It's been in service for 60 years plus, the M4, M16, some variation thereof. So I never really thought this was going to happen. And it just happened. I mean, just out of the blue, news hit, U.S. Army made the decision, and the Marines are going to follow suit to adopt this M5 system and presumably to replace M4s in service. Thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it goes with uh, without saying that that is going to be a huge defense budget. So we'll see if they uh, if they actually truly get that budget. I mean, they say that they've chosen it, accepted it, or whatever. But will they actually go through with it? Yeah. Well, they're mm -hmm. saying hundreds of thousands of units. I can only imagine the cost is not going to be insignificant. But keep in mind, folks, it's not just the cost of the rifle itself. You have to update armories, retrain armorers, retrain troops. It's an entirely new weapon system. SIG says that the M5 has familiar fire controls, and it does. It has the ping pong paddle of the M16, has a selector lever right where troops expect it to be right now. But it's a significantly more powerful cartridge. And so this is going to cause pretty much the same problems we ran into when we adopted the M14 coming out of World War II. The M14 had full auto capability. The new M5 is going to have full auto capability. But going back to the cost, it's not just the cost of the firearm or the new XM157 optic, which is going to be outrageously expensive. They've committed to buying 250000 of as well to go with the M5. <laughs> I mean, we're talking billions and billions of dollars and, you know, years of refitting our military and retraining our military to use this new weapon system interesting i do i find it quite interesting because i actually was looking forward to going to something potentially bigger right now i i'm a firm believer that i think they chose wrong right <laughs> in terms of going up size and platform because that's what they did i mean they've now gone into the what you want i mean to keep things simple the ar-10 sphere now right, right. now we've gone into a bigger chassis bigger magazines bigger bullets and cartridge in, in general bigger more weight more, 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 more recoil. Right. So, I mean, and, and what's funny is I would imagine a semi-auto, right? Like any, you know, good soldier does, you know, aimed fire, right? Semi-auto, I'm sure it'd be just fine. Full auto though, every video I have seen of somebody running this thing in full auto, it is just jumping all over the place. And what I find interesting is there was one video, one of the guys showed me that, uh, of uh, some female shooting this thing in an indoor range and just watching her brace herself to get, you know, like anybody that shoots full auto does, you get a nice, good, you know, platform to spread to those legs out, lean into it. Still, like, you know, really spread out, and the thing is still pushing her back. And it's like, nice. So it's going to have some punch to it. So the, the host of Task and Purpose, great YouTube channel. If you guys mm -hmm. haven't checked it out, please do. Uh, they posted some video of their host, who is a army veteran. So he is experienced with firearms, and he was shooting this thing. And it was throwing him all over the place. There's no way that he could use controlled bursts on that thing. I mm -hmm. mean, the first shot on target, the rest of it's anti-aircraft fire. All right. Now, SIG has shown people shooting the thing. Now, look, I have video of me shooting a G3 on full auto when we were at the Brownells range day. And yes, you can see I can keep the gun on target. That's because I have a lot of experience. I'm a big guy, I weigh 200 pounds, and I've shot guns like that before. I know how to counteract those recoil impulses. 99% of military troops are not going to be able to do that. That's the whole reason we left the 308 behind. Well, one of the many reasons we left the 308 behind. Too much recoil. They took the full auto capability out of the M14 when we were using it as we were going into the Vietnam War. The M16 came about after that because it was lighter weight, lighter recoil, and full automatic fire was actually controllable and usable by the average troop. We've taken all that 
and just throwing it right out the window. Well, you got to remember, Vietnam was the era of just hose the jungle with with bullets. Like, right. and so the the more bullets you could carry, or, you know, a cartridges, the, the better things were for you. You could just hose everything, just level everything, just bomb everything, whatever right. it was. Right. So, uh, I don't know. I I think that going to this big this big platform. For, I mean, for instance, right? I think for the M4 to be replaced, I think they did. The only platform, in my opinion, that would actually work as a good replacement for the M4 is the MCX or Virtus, if you will. Thank that you is. for saying that, because I was going to say, I, I disagree with the cartridge. Mm -hmm. I think the rifle itself is the best choice they could have made, mm -hmm. because that's something that I've been playing with for several years myself. And I was going through my old photos the other day trying to find an image for uh, a video edit I was doing. And I realized how long I have been shooting the Virtus. And I'm like, holy cow. You know, I've put a lot of rounds to the thing. And people that watch the channel know it's my go-to rifle. And I love the thing. I really think it's the future of small arms. And the fact that the military adopted the M5, which literally is an upsized <clears throat> MCX Virtus, I felt vindicated in my choice because I saw so much potential in the weapon itself. But the 6.8 by 51, I'm scratching my head going, huh? We've gone completely full circle here. We went from the STG-44 and the entire world recognizing the fact that we were using the wrong weapon and the wrong cartridge. We needed to get, you know, have full auto capability and a lightweight rifle that was controllable on full auto fire with a cartridge that was smaller, lightweight. You could carry more ammunition. That was the whole concept behind the Sturmgewehr and or the Storm rifle from World War II that really changed the whole landscape and military thinking and tactics thinking coming out of that conflict. Right. That gave birth to the M4. <clears throat> that gave birth to a whole host of weapons, the FAMAS, the Steyrog, go down the list, the HK-33. The whole world realized, oops, we need to go to a smaller cartridge because most fights happen within 300 yards. But you're always fighting the last war. So we come out of Vietnam and some of the proxy wars during the Cold War, and then we find ourselves in Afghanistan, and now we're shooting across ridgelines. Mm -hmm. And the, the 556 was falling way short, and our enemy with 54R and PKMs were wearing our troops out. Mm -hmm. So now we had to think, uh oh, we got to rethink, rethink things. So another knee jerk reaction Big Army goes, well, let's just adopt a really big cartridge, and now we can shoot across ranges like that too. Right. Instead of selectively like DMRing it, which I agreed with that concept, now let's just out, outfit the entire platoon with M5s. Give them full auto capability and let them just go hose the ridgeline again. I, I just, they'll, they'll teach discipline, fire control discipline. I mean, that's a new standard. Right. I mean, as I would assume. But the recoil, would. can you imagine, and especially with them starting to allow women into, and I'm, this isn't going to be some you know sexist rant, but generally speaking, women are, are smaller frames and less size. Most men are going to be, especially the guys that like to work out and stuff, they're going to be 180, 220 pounds, right? That gives you something to counteract that recoil force with. If you're 150 pounds, that gun's going to push you all over the place. Your qualification scores, even smaller guys that go into the military, not just women, smaller guys that go into the military, their qualification scores are going to go down, I believe, because of that recoil. Now, I've yet to shoot one, but there's right. nothing I see in the design because I have an MCX that mitigates recoil. Yeah, I mean, with the MCX... I the idea, I mean, we've showed this before in video, the uh, the recoil mechanism itself being contained in the receiver and being able to side fold the stock and all that stuff. One of my things was SIG had come out with, they had what, the 716 series of guns, right? And that was a piston-driven AR-10, if you will. Then they came out with the 716 G2. And it was basically, and I think they've already discontinued that gun. They discontinue was, a lot of it was, stuff. It was briefly out. Um, and I was like, well, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you kind of build that into the MCX platform? I've always wondered why they didn't do it. I always thought, and this is just my personal opinion, that maybe they couldn't do it. Maybe the, the recoil mechanism being contained in the receiver was too much. You know what I mean? Like for the power of that cartridge. Well, it turns out they were doing forward, it. It turns yeah. out they were doing it. And it was the, the spear thing that came out. Right. I want to handle one of these things so bad. You have no idea. Oh, I want to be able too. to handle it, look at it and, and see what makes it tick because I'm very curious. I want to shoot it. I want to, you know, because shooting an MCX or a Virtus, the recoil impulse out of a piston gun is probably the best out of any piston guns that have ever fired, you know, AR-15 piston, ARX-100, uh, ACR, all that stuff. 
the recoil impulse off of the Virtus is super smooth and soft. It is. You know, because it there's is. such low reciprocating mass in yeah. there with that small carrier. Well, and you've on. got higher weight too. Yeah, and the gun is heavier. Yeah. It is like it, there's no chunky doubt about it. It, 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 could, it, could, it could lose some weight. <clears throat> right. I mean, and, and here's to hoping, right? right here's right. to hoping right. that, uh, you know, maybe. But now you're going up in that AR-10 size that I'm going to call it. I'm going to compare it to the AR-10. Now you've upsized the gun. There's no way you're dropping weight. No. Especially going into this 277 Fury or 68 by 51 with its super high pressure. And that's the other thing about this thing. Okay, so that's great. You adopted this. But as we know, speed and heat and pressures is going to kill barrels. This right. thing is going to be a barrel munching machine. And right. I just feel like they're just going to be money, money, money. It's going to be like uh, <laughs> it's going to be like the dirt bike world. Uh, KTM keeps taking money. You know what I mean? Like. I can and, confirm that. <laughs> I can confirm that. <laughs> so, so you know, I feel like that this this new spear gun is just going to be a. Who knows? I want to be proved wrong. I want to I be mean, proved wrong. And we touched on this. We touched on this when we did the caliber discussion. Uh, you know, back when um, FN and who was it Remington and Magpul that were submitting the ACR mm -hmm. platform, we were having the trials of the Scar, and the ACR and. Um, arguably scars marketing was better and you know fn is no uh stranger to the the military arms game you know we yeah. use the the 249 the 240 bravo um i carried an fn m16 one deployment um fn if anybody i think has the production capability to meet the demands of a military bid but i mean you know acr fell short because of um manufacturing you know they couldn't meet the manufacturing demands FN fell short, I think, because they just were too big. I think it was too big. The complaints were they were too heavy. And everybody that used one ultimately ended up going back to some kind of variant of the M4. And, I mean, this, this was not general line troops. These were the, you know, the forward-working guys. Like the Rangers that yeah. adopted them for Rangers, a short time yeah. went right back to the M4. Right. Yeah, Rangers that tried the them 16 out. you're talking about, right? Going that the, – Well, they were the heavy the 16. The, yes, they, you know the, I mean. if, if I remember correctly, wasn't Army trying both because Army liked the, the heavy option. So, so the heavy wound up primarily being used in, you know, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but primarily used by SOCOM Special Operations. Right. Um, you know, I know the SEALs use them. It, and we have customers that are SEALs, and they've talked about them. Um, you know, it's kind of a love-hate thing there. It right. depends on who you talk to. Right. Um, I think the problem that FN made with the gun, and we've learned this through our own testing, is it's not something that is easily convertible between cartridges. Right. So uh, hopefully the spear, one of the things that SIG has said publicly is that they plan on offering it to the civilian world as a 308, as the 277 Fury, as perhaps 65 Creedmoor. But we know what happens when you put a 65 Creedmoor barrel in a in a scar. It it poops all over itself. Yeah. It right. pops primers and the primers get in there, cause hard hard stoppages That's that are very different. Problem. It's That's a known problem. We've internet. documented it. We got yeah. two guns now that are suffering from hard malfunctions because FN and that has, I think. A lot to do with the design of the SCAR. The SCAR is actually pretty ingenious in its design, especially around the 308 and mitigating the recoil impulses because it has a very long unlock time. Oh, yeah. But yeah. that does not favor the high pressure of the 6.5 Creedmoor and its pressure peaking because it's pushing those primers back out uh, during that long unlocking process. And that's what and they're going to have to redesign the rifle if they're going to get it to work or make a smaller firing pin hole. But I'm way off in the weeds here. So I, I think, I hope that the M5 has gone through a serious evolution of weight reduction because man alive, you know, the modern kit that a soldier has to carry, especially an 0311 or 11 Bravo, they got to carry a lot of crap. Yes. Mm -hmm. They really yeah. do. Yes. I mean, you're talking 60, 80 pounds of stuff, right? And the last thing you need is doubling the weight of your ammunition supply, going from 30 round magazines back to 20 round magazines and maybe 25 rounders, depending on what the army and military in general, the Marines, you know, agree to. Uh, I've seen the weapons being tested with Lancer magazines. So you're going down in volume in the number of cartridges that's actually in the weapon. You're going up in weight, up in recoil, and it's just going to burden that that ground pounder even more, in my opinion, at what trade-off, right? Are, are they really going to... Now, it's being coupled with this new Vortex optic, they say. which they're calling the M157, right? Which is a smart optic with an etched reticle, but it has ballistic... Uh, holdovers. It has one to eight magnification, 30 millimeter objective lens. 
uh, if the batteries die in it, you lose the range estimation, uh, you lose the wind holds and things like that. Well, maybe not. That's probably built into the reticle. But also it has communications capabilities where uh, it can share. You can tag a target that you see through your scope, and it'll transmit that to the rest of your squad, platoon, whatever, that's also out there so everybody can see everybody tagging targets. I mean, that functionality is kind of cool. The cost of the thing is going to be astronomical, probably more than the firearm itself. But you know, they're adopting this to try to increase hit probability out of a weapon system that's going to be inherently, in my opinion, decreasing hit probability just because of the recoil impulse for a lot of troops that are, I mean, we, we've all seen it, right? On qualification, just, just, just in training, just watching people who've never fired a weapon before shoot an M16 for the first time, they're like, waiting for a recoil. And then when they realize, oh, this is like a 22, you know, they, they can learn to shoot. They, their mind goes away from the recoil and they can focus on the, the sight picture and actually qualifying. Imagine what happens when they go, boom, and that thing gives them a whack in the shoulder. And they're like, oh, now their mind's run in two different directions, right? Mm -hmm. Getting that sight on target and then like, oh boy, anticipating that shot. Let them flip the giggle switch. You spend a day, like an actual, because I, I remember this stuff even, you know, in, in certain particular schools in the army that I had done you spend a day on the range shooting some of these guns and it just starts it, you hit that wrong spot in a shoulder a yep. collarbone especially from whatever, the prone yeah and you're exactly and you're yeah, just prone. sitting there like trying to find something to put a little padding in there <laughs> you know and then your shots start decreasing right your yep. accuracy starts decreasing because you're trying to now you're focusing on all this you know, pain that you've caused yourself because you didn't have the stock properly placed somewhere. Or maybe you did, and it just keeps kicking the crap out of that same spot over and over and over again. You know, looking at you like 50 BMG rifle, you know, stupid. <laughs> but, so, but anyway, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, I can settle on recoil all day long here, but I'm also looking at the cost of this thing, right? The future soldier, how many times of this, like... The cost is too much. Right. I think the it's cost is going to be too much. And I think, you know, anybody, all these little higher-ups that sit and don't do any work in office, they're going to sit there and say, eh, this just cost too much and just end it at that. You know what I mean? That's why I say, are they really going to get this? They say they did. They say they did. When I start seeing them in the hands, we'll probably watch that number go from 250000 to, like, 20000 Well, they <laughs> didn't they cut the Joint Strike Fighter budget in half once they finalized a, a build cost for one <laughs> right. of them. I mean, that program... Went like 10 times over a projected yeah, budget. Right. Yeah, and I mean, it, look, the, if you can make anything more modular than an M4, M16 platform, especially given the age of that one, I mean, he was pretty forward-thinking when he... Stoner's a genius. Yeah, yeah. If you can make that wheel any rounder in 2022, I think that the SIG ticks a lot of boxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, definitely look, pick the right weapon. Right. Definitely p pick the right weapon. Absolutely. It's the cartridge. And, and I'm I, just like I scratching don't, my I head. I don't want to admit it, but I think the cost, the combined cost of cartridge production, platform conduct, uh, production, and this optic that you're talking about. I mean, Army has always had one of the bigger budgets. You know what I'm saying? But you, anybody that's worked a government job knows the, the saying, right? You don't use it, you lose it. So how are we going to procure the biggest budget we can for the next 10 years. Well, let's develop a new rifle, ammo, and sighting platform. Mm -hmm. as, am, as, as ambitious as that is, an army is ambitious with their budget. I don't think, I don't think SIG can meet the production numbers, and I don't think that Vortex can do it in, in, in the, I mean, I don't see that thing hitting the field in the, in the, configuration that they're projecting within the next eight years i just don't I, see it i see that's where i disagree i think they can meet the production you think so because the reason why so many shooters here in the commercial market probably aren't seeing vertices or you know the pistol rifle or whatever is because one they're snatched up as fast as they can even come out i mean we can't and get them two, in the shop it's just kind of like anything else they're going to focus on those military contracts first right in the commercial market it's going to get this very small piece of the pie that burned colt well, they get the small piece of the pie, right? Like, look at LMT, right? They always got their little focusers or blinders on just the foreign contracts right now. And the commercial market gets like, I want to throw out just a random number, 1% of their full production thing or something. Whatever the right? production right. overrun is. Right. Yeah. They get this such a small piece of the pie, and I think that's what SIG's doing right now. I well, think guys, they're, they're able to do it. Keep in mind, when the government buys a weapon system, they buy the rights to that weapon system. 
Now they can have patents. Remember Colt had a patent on the M4 feed ramp for a while, but the minute that patent expired, FN started using it, right? FN was making rifles. Keep in mind, while SIG will most likely build the majority of the rifles, they can subcontract a lot of those parts. There will be a lot of companies involved in the production of this rifle. And then when patents expire, you're going to see FN making these things and other companies is assuming the rifle stays in service that long. I'm assuming it will mm -hmm. because the next step from gunpowder and lead bullets is laser guns, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going, to be, we're going to be chucking rocks at each other for a long time, at least in my lifetime. If we're I still can't get a lightsaber, I'm not interested. Yeah, High-speed <laughs> rocks will be gone for a little while here. But. Right. So keep in mind that, that there is that component when the U.S. government comes in and buys something. Take a look at the M9, for example. Remember all the problems the M9 had, locking pieces, bad magazines, and all that stuff? You had subcontractors that the government was buying low-bid replacement parts for that were winding up in the field that were causing the guns problem. Not only that, I wanted to bring up the point that we just adopted a new service handgun and spent billions on that. But that a that, gun that's it's not even used in frontline service. This is a gun for pogues and people that officers and you know, I don't know, tank commanders. I mean, a handgun isn't a primary fighting weapon, right? It just isn't. And mm -hmm. we spent all that money updating a handgun, and now we're going to go. Oh, hey, now we're going to adopt a new service rifle. They should have just left the M9 alone and adopted their new service rifle because they wasted a lot of money. On the M17. Oh, I know. They didn't gain anything. Like that money could have definitely. The M17 didn't do anything. The, the, the M9 didn't. Yeah. No, it, it, it doesn't. But we'll see. We'll see how this goes. But I, I definitely say out of all the guns out there, the MCX is definitely the one to replace it just because of that modularity. Different yeah. handguards, yeah. different stocks, different, you know, the wearable parts that you can replace on that thing. The barrel the, change. Yeah, the barrel change. And that's the one thing that I was going to bring up when we were talking about the FN thing for a minute. It seems like people like SIG kind of understand gas systems, if you will. So whereas FN tried to put Creedmoor in the SCAR, and you notice that they didn't change really anything. It's still Nothing. the same. It's it, it's the same. It's a barrel. Yeah, it was literally just a barrel in there. They And so I don't know if they even changed even the gas jet size or anything in there. And to me, it seems like they wanted to put Creedmoor in there without producing anything extra. You know what I mean? Whereas SIG might do Creedmoor, and you might notice this on the barrel, like when you talk carbine, mid-length, rifle length. Now you're starting to see companies, and this isn't anything new, but you got like carbine plus one, mid-length plus one, plus two, or whatever, right? Right. Where I think SIG will actually look at that and put a right gas system in whatever caliber that they're using. You yeah. know what I mean? No so. doubt SIG has spent a lot of time, obviously, because like you said, we were wondering why we would never, we weren't seeing an upsized Virtus that could handle 308 or something like mm -hmm. that. And the whole reason, most likely, is because it was under a veil of secrecy because it was being developed for the U.S. military as the 68 Fury or the 277 Fury, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I I think what do you guys think the chances are that the the 277 Fury becomes too much? It's kind of like when the FBI adopted the 10 millimeter, the qualification scores <laughs> plummeted, then they had the FBI load, which was the PUD oh, load that God. evolved into the 40 Smith and Wesson, and now the 40 Smith and Wesson is just people realize this is this doesn't do anything other than nine millimeter. Now the FBI is back to nine millimeter and 40 Smith and Wessons and its death throws and 10 millimeters coming back because it's actually 357 Magnum in a handgun it lo lo loads itself. But what do you think the chances are? that this thing goes into service, qualification scores go down, people start complaining about the recoil of the thing and the weight of the thing and everything else, and because of its modularity, they go to a different caliber. Maybe they even go to the Virtus. What What do you think of the Virtus in something like a 6.8? Imagine if they'd taken that technology. And one thing I don't know if we've touched upon here, you did briefly, they've increased the operational pressure of the cartridge in the 277 Fury, and I'm using that interchangeably with 6.8 by 51. They've increased the operational pressure. Where six, six, uh, I'm sorry, five, five, six operates at about sixty-five thousand psi. This new cartridge, the six eight by fifty-one, operates at eighty thousand psi. So it has a multi-part case, has a steel head to contain that type of pressure, a brass case, and then gunpowder and a bullet, right? And it's shooting, it, it's firing a one hundred and forty grain projectile at about three hundred or three thousand feet per second. Okay, twenty-nine fifty, a six. Five PRC, a cartridge I can go buy right now, I have a rifle that chambers it, shoots a 143 grain bullet at 2,950 feet per second, and it comes nowhere near 80,000 PSI. It's a brass case. Only difference is the 6.5 PRC requires a longer barrel to get up to speed, where the 6.8, I think the whole reason why they went with such a high pressure cartridge is because they wanted to get that bullet up to speed in a shorter barrel, right? So they didn't have to have a 20 inch plus barrel to get that velocity. The reasons given for, for for adopting this was obviously extended range, better CQB, 
presumably penetration. But they also, I've heard people throwing around this, this notion that it was designed to, to defeat Russian and Chinese body armor. Well, let me tell you about Russian body armor that we've seen in Ukraine. It's garbage. It's, it's literally tightly woven wool, and it's not body armor. There's no Kevlar in it. It's, they, the Russians have never used real body armor. They just tell their troops they give them body armor. It, the Russians don't care about the lives of even their own soldiers. The Chinese, they got this titanium body armor people are talking about. Okay, so let's say that by some miracle, this 140 grain bullet going at 3,000 feet per second does more than my 6.5 PRC 140 grain bullet going at 3,000 feet per second, which a sappy plate will stop. Let's, let's say that it does penetrate this magical titanium armor. We're going to spend billions of dollars updating the weapon system to adopt this new high-powered cartridge, and the Chinese will just change the body armor and improve it in a year, and now our weapon system doesn't defeat the armor. It, so that doesn't float with me. So the whole purpose of this has to be extended range and better penetration. Couldn't they have accomplished that with the 6.8 SPC with a steel head on it and increase the 6.8 SPC's operational pressure to 80,000 PSI and a smaller rifle like the Virtus that you see here? They could have. I mean, doesn't that make more sense? It, it just seems to me like the Army didn't think this through. This, it, It's just a, a boondoggle. I I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope this turns out to be the most incredible weapon system ever fielded because I want our troops to have the absolute best weapon system that can be provided them. But I don't get the 6.8 x 51. I just I don't. don't. I think that doing 6 arc, 6 8, whatever you want to call it, in the actual Virtus and maintaining that same magazine size, we know the 6.8, you know, Barrett made a 30 round 6.8 magazine at, at some point. That know, works. It's still out there. Um, you know, so I mean, this is, to me, that was the way to go. That's the intermediate cartridge kind of that we were looking right. for. It was there. It the gives you the range. PC. Gives you the 800 yards. Yep, gives you all that stuff. Gives you everything. There it was. And it's in a, in a weapon system that's smaller, <clears throat> lighter. They could put this thing, they could put the Virtus on a weight reduction program, shave some weight off of it, put a 6.8 in it, give it a higher operational pressure, and or 6 arc, whatever, extend that range, and you're not carrying around twice a heavy rifle, twice as heavy ammunition, and magazines that hold 20, 25 rounds versus 30 rounds. Yep. I do know? love their uh, belt fed, though. I do have to say that that belt fed and that 6.8 will probably make a lot of sense. And I wanted to come back to that G3 you were talking about in full auto. I remember shooting that thing at that Brownell shoot as well. And it is kind of funny when you do shoot those things that as soon as you pull the trigger, everything just turns to a blur. Yeah, like the sights disappear, blur, everything. Everything's just blurring all over the place, and you're just kind of holding on. You know that this thing is still pointing because you can see the outline of the dirt berm still there, and you're not looking at blue sky. You know what I mean? So it, it's right. It's definitely one of those things, and I'll be curious to see what this is. I so want to shoot this thing. I so want to. Tim, you said something uh, when we were doing our caliber discussion video about um, you personally would want our military to have the best, most advanced equipment for them to achieve their goal, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about that a lot since then because I agree. But to me, the feasibility of re-outfitting re an entire, e just even the entire army versus training and doctrine on what they've got, using what they have better, I think certainly there's a cost differential there. But I mean, I... I've been following your channels long since before I've been working for Copper Custom, and I remember videos of you walking up to a table with a, an A2 on it and picking that thing up, and just as freely as you're you know, brushing dirt off your shoulder, you're smacking steel way better than the average shooter can with a 5.56 you know, platform because you're familiar with that, you've trained on it. And I think that, and I hate to loop back around to a caliber discussion, but we're talking an every-person rifle here. I can see something like this making it through like the focus groups and the trials groups and making it into like a forward operating environment, you know, seals, rangers, berets, um, tack peas. I can see them using something so modular because their training doctrine alone on any platform is exhaustive. I mean, to the point where they're doing it like they're brushing dirt right. off their shoulder. Handing something as modular as that is to a line troop, I think is money spent in the wrong direction. They don't have a need for 75% of the capabilities of that rifle. They needed to aim and hit where they're aiming. And I think a lot of that budget that we're devoting to a, a, an extremely modular, not only rifle, but a new round that shoots it, like you said, you know, shooting these things on full auto in the new cartridge is, is a handful. Whereas for our everyday troops, if we want them to effectively be able to defend, say, a FOB or a combat outpost, 
we give them M4s, M16s with a controllable round, and then we train the ever-living daylights out of them to be as effective as they can with that round. I mean, it's the acronym KISS, keep it simple, stupid, right? Do we need to spend all this money, all this R&D, all this new training for everybody in the Army, or do we adjust our training doctrine a little bit and teach them to be as effective as possible and ex exploit what we already have on hand? I think that, to, to me personally, the gap between training and cost is enough to say that that's, that's not going to make it to general use. Two thoughts on that. So what if you took a fire team, a Marine Corps fire team, and the team leader had the M5, and then the rest of the team had M4s while well, they're using the, the IARs, you know, which was really intended to be used as a, a light automatic weapon. I think the Marines are just being a little bit crafty there <laughs> and, and twisting their budget around like, oh, no, actually, we're going to use this as an infantry rifle. Um, but let them continue to use the HK infantry rifles in 5.56, give that team leader the, the M5 with the increased optics capability, and he can talk to other teams in the platoon and squad, you know, through the optic that this thing has, the, the, the XM-157, but not outfit the entire you know, fire team with that particular weapon. It's just like having a 203 gunner in the fire yeah, team. It's that like I having, could feasibly right? see. Right? So, so but then <clears throat> it becomes a logistics problem. So now you're not just pumping 5.56 five, out into a battlefield through your logistics lines, trying to keep your, your soldiers fighting. You have handgun ammunition going out, minimal. You have rifle ammunition going out. You have belt-fed machine gun ammunition going out. And then you have M5 ammunition going out. Right. Well, if they adopted the the XM250, which is the Sig Sauer belt-fed lightweight machine gun, which also shoots the 6.8x51. So the, the 6.8x51 would feed the M5 and, and the uh, M250. But if we have the M4s out there, we still got to pump out the 5.56. Five, and so that causes a logistical nightmare, right? Because now you're, you're running. And this also dovetails into, I can only imagine what our NATO allies are saying right now. Oh, they're probably they're losing like, their mind. What did you just do? We all just standardized on 556. Five, Finally, new members to NATO like Estonia, Latvia, all these new these new NATO members. And we just got them to convert to 556. Five, like, sorry, everybody. Sorry. We, did, we meant to tell you about this, but we couldn't because it was a secret. We just adopted a brand new weapon system and cartridge. You know, it's, it's like, time to pay both, up. Both you know, that, developed by SIG. I mean, that was pretty clever. I know. I, 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 I mean, good wine and dine. Not only, there, not only are we going to give you a new gun, but let us sell you on a brand new boutique round. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, all they're putting all of their apples in one basket, mm -hmm. and that bit Colt hard. That bit Colt really, really hard. In the long term, it did. It, yeah. it, it took sixty years, but it put Colt out of the business. But. So then the other thing I brought up at the beginning of the video, and let's touch upon this quickly, um, civilians. So the whole world, everybody we know, 99% of the customers that come into copper, they want a 5.56, generally an AR-15. Some people want AKs. You know, everybody has their thing, so I won't say 99%, but people are looking at true intermediate cartridges, right? That's what Americans have adopted for home defense, you know, you know peanut butter hits the fan type situation, whatever. That's what Americans use. Americans love their AR-15s. Americans love their 5.56. I've never been an advocate of 5.56. I thought it's a varmint cartridge from when I was a kid shooting it, you know, in high school. It was a varminting cartridge and a gas gun. Um, so I think we could have done better. I think the 6.8, 6R, things like that, we've already had that discussion. But civilians, do you think they're going to follow suit? Do you think people are going to start ditching their 5.56 ARs and start no, snatching no. up spears? No and, way. And, no. No way. Other companies are going to start making rifles chambered for the, the new 6.8. Because believe me, when Big Army does something, everybody follows. It happens. The AR-15, when I was a kid, they, they, they didn't sell well. They just didn't sell well, right? It took years, decades, before all these training companies came about. We got into an endless war, and then all of a sudden, the AR-15 became America's rifle. When I was a kid, America's rifle was a 30-30 lever action. Today, it's the AR-15, more AR-15s are sold every year than any other type of rifle. And a lot of that has to do with the U.S. military and its, its, its adoption of it. Just look at anybody that goes to a, a training you know, course. They're all decked out like they're spec ops operators. They got right. their bump helmets and their, their right. multi-cam. You know, they're, they're emulating what they either have had experience with or want to be. And, and so they're, they're, they're using the cartridge and the weapon system that our special operations and general line troops are using. No different than police officers. When the police officers all went to 40 Smith & Wesson, civilians started buying up 40 Smith & Wesson. And now the 40 Smith & Wesson's dying. Everybody's going back 9 millimeter, and you can't give a 40 Smith & Wesson away. So what I'm saying is, is I do think the civilian market is going to slowly start to adopt this cartridge. And more companies are going to start 
making rifles to accommodate that desire. And ammo companies are going to step up and start producing this stuff. Because if big army is going to commit that heavily to it, the civilians are going to follow in, in suit. It might not be tomorrow. But I guarantee you, if this thing's in service for 10 years, 10 years from now, there's going to be a lot of people shooting 277 Fury. I don't know. Uh, I think what's going to end up me. happening is maybe not necessarily a 277 Fury being uh, into the civilian market. I think, I, I honestly, just because of the multi-part cartridge and the fact that it operates at whatever PSI, 80,000 PSI, I mean... God, I feel like that can't be. I, I feel like that's got to be like a thousand round barrel life. You know what I mean? Like I just, I, I honestly feel like the barrel life is going to be so small in that that not most people aren't even going to look at this thing because unless they can bring that, I guess you could have the six eight by fifty one and have it in a complete brass case, lower the pressure and kind of neuter it a little bit, maybe, maybe, but. I think that, that that cost of that cartridge is, is just going to be too much for the average because I would yep, never switch to it's it. It's going to be cost prohibitive. Yeah. Well, in the beginning, guys, it's economy of scale, right? So once the Army commits to it and Federal or whomever, SIG, whoever's making the I mean, there'll be multiple manufacturers making it, they're going to produce millions and millions of rounds. In the beginning, it is going to be expensive. It's expensive now. You know, I made the comment that, you know, you can't even, in our last video, you can't even get the ammunition and SIG corrected me and said, actually, it's on our website was out of stock, but they, it is for sale on their website if you can catch it in stock. <laughs> half right. And there must be a big demand for it. So I was say, who, who they're moving the hundreds of millions around. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what gun is there now available? I mean, I've seen a few spears pop sure, up for 30 the, grand. Uh, if right, you wanna... for 30 grand, it's like, <laughs> you know, right. but who's, who's you know, snatching up all the 277 Fury, you know what I mean? The five like, people that bought really the spears for 30 grand, stock. yeah. <laughs> so it's it's uh it'll be interesting i do think that we're going to see the civilians start to embrace it it's not going to be right away people aren't going to give up their five five six it's just too effective i mean too too cost effective to shoot it's it's lightweight we've we've all been shooting it i mean there's five generations of people that have used that cartridge now it's going to take a while to pry people away from their ar-15s the light recoil the lightweight and and you know for most people five five six is all they really need Right, but you will start to see people to adopt this new cartridge, and people are going to clamor for the M5 if they can get their hands on it. They just are, and I think in ten years you're going to see if Big Army continues to use this, it'll be interesting. I also think the modularity of of the rifle itself lends itself to rechambering. So if this thing flops because barrel life, heat generation, recoil becomes too much. They can slap a 308 barrel in it and call it good, and we're right back to a NATO standard. That is good, kind of a nice safety net. I think that's going to be the safety I net think, right there. I think that's ultimately what is going to happen. Yep. The cartridge is not going to take off if for no other reason than Americans can't reload it in their basement. Oh, you can reload it. I mean, really? yeah, because it, the, the head is the only steel part, and you just resize down to the head. You can reload it, yeah. No. Yeah, you can reload it. Well, but I stand corrected. It, it's 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 um there's no dies that i'm aware of sig will probably correct me but <laughs> you know, we have dies on our website they're on stock <laughs> but we have one on our website um but yeah i uh i don't know man I, I i do think over time you will see civilians adopting it whether they need it or not well that's never really been a factor in well, most people's not purchasing the, decisions the m5 you know what i mean it may be in the an ar-10 AR yeah because let's be honest i mean even the, the vertus is like Twenty three hundred dollars or something. Yeah. I guarantee this this new gun and try and get, try world getting parts. Is going to be three grand. Exactly. Diamondback Arms will have theirs out in two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> it'll yeah. be made out of polymer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They'll have that one out. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I appreciate the discussion. Absolutely. Hopefully, everybody watching, you enjoyed the conversation. Maybe you learned a little bit about the uh, the new weapon system that the U.S. military is adopting, the M5 service rifle and the M250 belt-fed lightweight machine gun, both chambered at 6.8 by 51. If you guys enjoy the content that we produce here at the Military Arms Channel, please consider becoming part of our Patreon family. There will be a link in the video description below. You'll get direct access to me. I answer all private communications, and we have some other perks as well. So, also, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Thank you guys for 14 years of support, and we will talk to you guys soon.